In 1980, CTS was required to submit this notification of hazardous waste activity to the EPA. In the report, CTS acknowledged generating and disposing of hazardous waste off-site. As a result, the EPA added the CTS property to its inventory of Superfund sites that year in 1980. Then in 1985, CTS submitted an assessment report, required by state law so officials could gauge any potential risk to the public. CTS reported the nearest residents lived 500 yards, or 1,500 feet, away from the plant, and they all use city water. Those two statements are factually incorrect. But state officials didn't question the information from CTS, and two weeks later, they sent this letter to the EPA Superfund Division. The state reiterated what CTS reported to them, claiming there are no known drinking wells in the area, and the site poses no threat to human health. They then ranked the site as a low priority. State and EPA officials accepted CTS's report without question. In 1990, five years after receiving the CTS report, the EPA hired a private company called NUS to thoroughly inspect the old CTS site to assess whether conditions had changed. NUS inspectors came to Asheville and soon found information that conflicted with the CTS report. After reviewing records from the Buncombe County Water Department, NUS found there were 714 homes within four miles of the CTS plant that relied on private wells for drinking water, despite what CTS had reported in 1985. But in 1990, NUS also overlooked something very important. While conducting a risk assessment for the EPA, NUS listed the closest private well as being 4,000 feet away from the CTS site, when in fact the Rice family lived right next door their well was only about 50 feet away. I just think EPA has just made mistakes from the very beginning. We contacted the EPA and a representative from NUS to find out what had happened, but they haven't provided an explanation. We know the Rices, along with many other nearby families, were living closer than 4,000 feet away from the CTS site. Mm -hmm. In 1990, many were using wells for their drinking water, but for some reason, NUS failed to include those families in their report and as a result, any potential risk associated with their drinking water was also overlooked. We were using spring water. It seems like you could have knocked on some doors. <laughs> <laughs> For the past six years, high school Good. history teacher Tate McQueen Good. That's great. has made it his mission to uncover the truth. Yeah. He and his family live Good. less than a mile from the CTS site. <laughs> He's the vice president of a community action group focused on getting the site cleaned up. <laughs> ah, wipe out. <laughs> this is a major contamination zone. In 2010, McQueen and 24 other families filed a civil lawsuit against CTS Corporation. In court documents, they claim CTS caused the contamination, which created a continuous nuisance. The plaintiffs claim the contamination has harmed both their health and property values. The suit demands CTS clean up the site immediately and compensate affected families. In September, CTS appealed the lawsuit to the U.S. Supreme Court. We tried to speak with CTS officials about the case, but they haven't returned our calls. In 1990, they went into this ditch area. The Queen um, filed a lawsuit in 2010 after learning trees, NUS had tested the Rice Springs in 1990 uh -huh. without their permission. Rice Correct. Before and that, the only thing the Rices knew was that their well water had always tasted horrible. For nine years. But they didn't know the reason the water tasted bad was because it was full of contaminants. The Rices say they would have stopped using their well water immediately in 1990 oh. if NUS or the EPA had simply warned them about the contamination. It was hard to believe that somebody that is supposed to be protecting the people would do that to a family. NUS completed the site inspection of CTS in 1991. Even though NUS found TCE and other toxic chemicals at the site, the EPA decided no further action was needed to clean it up. NUS's report stated the contamination could potentially affect the air as well as the ground and surface water. They determined the on-site exposure is not of concern because a chain link fence around the plant limits access to the facility. EPA officials agreed with the findings and issued their final report in 1991. That same day, the EPA archived CTS, essentially removing it from their list of Superfund sites. Nearby residents had no idea this had even happened. You, know, you, you don't expect people to, 
to do things like that. Meanwhile, Dot and Larry Rice felt their water just wasn't safe to drink. So during a drought in 1986, they shelled out $1,500 to connect their home to city water. But when the drought was over later on that year, they continued using well water. But the Rice's two sons who lived on the same property next door didn't have a choice. They relied exclusively on well water. But the two boys over there were still drinking the water. Then in 1999, tragic news. <laughs> Larry was diagnosed with a brain tumor. That same year, just a few months later, the Rices complained to state officials saying they felt their spring water was contaminated. <laughs> they uh, started doing some testing and, and they came up with the, the TCE. State inspectors found TCE in both the Rices spring and the Robinson's well water. That day in 1999 was the first time residents were told their water was contaminated. Even then, both the EPA and NUS failed to disclose the fact they knew about contamination nine years earlier, back in 1990. They would have let us die. Both families suspected TCE is what caused their health problems, but a local oncologist we spoke with says proving that is nearly impossible. So we really don't know a whole lot about the long-term exposure, uh, except the links to cancer. In 1999, the EPA reported finding extremely high levels of TCE in the Rice's spring. 21,000 parts per billion. That's 7,000 times the state's regulated limit of three parts per billion in water. In 1999, the EPA put the CTS site back on the Superfund list and quickly issued an emergency action memo stating immediate action must be taken. Officials provided both families with bottled water and soon after connected city water lines to the Robinson's house and the two homes belonging to the Rice's sons. Ooh, EPA good. officials then delivered a harsh warning to both families. The water is very dangerous. You're not to drink it. You're not to bathe in it. You're not to wash clothes in it, wash dishes in it. It's very dangerous. In 2007, the EPA fenced off three acres of the Rice's property around their springs. Well, now that's where it all is. At the time, the Rice's were away in Florida. Without even telling us they was going to do it, they did it. Dot worried things were getting very serious. She wondered how long her family's water had been contaminated and whether that caused their health problems. Well, I was angry and, and I was devastated. Clues to some of her questions began to surface that year at Asheville's Pack Library. In 2007, the EPA sent this binder of information to the library and it soon caught the attention of local chemist, Barry Duran. There's an absolute responsibility here to hold accountability. It was the EPA's administrative record for the CTS site. The law requires the EPA to make these reports available to the public near Superfund sites where contamination must be cleaned up because it poses a threat to people's health. Duran noticed the official record was incomplete, so he questioned Buncombe County's hazardous waste officials. Why were certain pages missing? And basically, uh, I really didn't get much of an answer. Duran then photographed each page of the report, cover to cover, a decision that would later prove well, it, crucial. It, it paid off because the uh, administrative record was removed. Just six weeks after arriving at the library in 2007, Duran says that record mysteriously disappeared. He found this troubling considering these documents are required by federal law. Duran felt he could be onto something big. So he and McQueen contacted the EPA's point person at the time, David Dorian. Anywhere the contamination is gone is relevant. Who admitted removing the records. And David Dorian uh, has said to me on two different occasions that he removed the administrative record because the librarians were concerned, according to him, that his files were taking up too much space. But the head librarian, Ann Wright, tells us that's not true. Dorian won't comment because of the EPA's ongoing criminal investigation. At this point, McQueen began to suspect the EPA was trying to hide something. We've been asking for certain documents for years, and we never got them. He reviewed Duran's photos of the EPA's administrative record. The report detailed NUS's testing back in 1990. But it stopped abruptly on page 16, in mid-sentence, right before revealing the test results. And other pages were also missing. The references were missing, and the summary was missing. 
So where's the rest of the story? That story began to unfold in 2010, after McQueen and Duran obtained additional records from the state's file on CTS. The state's copy of the 1990 testing report included many of the pages missing from the EPA's report, including those showing NUS took samples from the Rice's private property without their permission. The state's report showed how NUS sampled the sediment in the Rice's spring in 1990 and found the toxic chemical DCE, which the EPA says is linked to cancer. Scientists say small traces of DCE indicate there's a source nearby with even higher levels of TCE. But according to the report, NUS didn't test for TCE on the Rice's property. I don't know why either TCE was not tested for or was not reported. As a scientist, that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. Dr. Jeff Wilcox teaches environmental science and geography at UNC Asheville. He says it's highly unusual to not test for TCE when DCE has been detected. It doesn't make any sense to me uh, why you would test for DCE and not also test for TCE, and it doesn't make any sense once you detected DCE that you wouldn't go back and test for TCE if you hadn't already. We contacted both NUS and the EPA for an explanation, but they haven't responded. The NUS report also shows they canceled all four of the groundwater tests they had originally scheduled around the CTS site in 1990. Wilcox says those early tests could have shown whether chemicals had begun seeping into residents' drinking water. The EPA won't comment on this, and there's nothing in the report to explain why those tests were canceled. No. It wasn't until 2010 that Dot Rice finally learned the truth about the testing done on her property back in 1990 some two decades after the EPA knew about the contamination. We asked her, hey, did you, re did you know that the EPA sampled your property on June 26th at 9.30 in the morning in 1990? And she said, no, I did not know that. And it was uh, heartbreaking. It makes me mad because they knew way before my kids were even thought of that this was going on with the water. Residents living nearby were also upset the EPA didn't tell them about the contamination either. So why wouldn't you go knock on the door and say, what's your water source? It was hard to believe that somebody that is supposed to be protecting the people would do that to a family. People wanted answers, and so did we. After requesting interviews with EPA officials for months, we were finally allowed to speak with Samantha Urquhart Foster. EPA will make a final decision on the cleanup plan. She's the EPA's project manager assigned to the CTS Superfund site. We spoke with her from Atlanta via satellite. But first, officials made it clear we only had about 15 minutes and we couldn't ask any questions about what the EPA had done in the past. If you're talking about things that happened before my time period, which has been in the past two and a half years, I'm not prepared to answer those questions. Our investigation continues as we examine what CTS's role was in all of this. We'll introduce you to a man who was in charge of running the CTS plant in Asheville. How can you undo something? You can't. I wish we could, but you can't. Why, nearly three decades later, he has now decided to break his silence for the first time ever. Coming up next. <laughs>